Are we all massive homers who will pick K-State to go to the Big 12 championship game? Find out next on 3 Ma. You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by Emprise Bank, your partner in Possible. Hello and welcome into another Three Mod Pod on the eve of the 2022 college football season. It is almost here. We are ready to talk plenty of football. We've got two pods coming at you this week. This one where we will go through K-State's schedule, make predictions essentially game by game, and give a, a little bit of an overview from a 20,000-foot view of what the season is going to look like for the Cats. Then coming up tomorrow, you're going to get a pod released with our full game preview, breakdown of the depth chart that we got this week, breakdown of the press conference that Chris Kleiman and players had leading up to South Dakota, little South Dakota preview and get you all set and ready to go for the Wildcats season opener coming up on Saturday. So going to be a great week here at the Three Mob Podcast and a great week overall with college football freaking returning people. We are ready. I am John Kurtz. As always, I'm joined by Derek Young from K-State Online and Cole Manbeck, former beat writer for the Manhattan Mercury. The show, as always, brought to you by Holiday Distillery. Great K-State folks over there that help support this pod. They have 360 Vodka, Ben Holiday Bottled and Bond Bourbon. I was actually out at the uh, Catbacker events earlier this week in Kansas City at Prairie Fire and had a gentleman come up and introduce himself to me and say how much he loved the pod. One, thank you, sir. But also, he said he tried uh, Ben Holiday Bottled and Bond Bourbon because of the reads here. That's your advertising dollars at work. And uh, he said it was great. He said he really enjoyed it, especially uh, for the cost of it. So uh, great deal and uh, great bourbon for you to go out and try there. There's a, a testimonial for you. But 360 Vodka, Ben Holiday, Bottled and Bond Bourbon, get them ready for your tailgates as you hit Bill Snyder Family Stadium on Saturday. We're also all rocking our, our Charlie Hustle t-shirts, as always here. See how much I can get up to the camera. Ugh. They've got a new line of K-State gear out, so make sure you get out and try those. You can rock that and roll in with your Ben Holiday, Bottled and Bond Bourbon into Bill Snyder Family Stadium on Saturday. Okay. We're here, important season for K-State football, all this talk throughout the offseason of, hey, we think this team's going to be pretty good. Then they turn into like popular Big 12 championship dark horse. Then they're not in the top 25 and kind of fade back. And now I feel like we're almost back to like chip on the shoulder kind of mode for this team, right? Is that is that fair that we've ridden a bit of a roller coaster here on where the expectations are for this team this year? DY, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they and they had the most players in the All Big Twelve team, I believe, uh, six. I want to say, yeah. or might, might have been seven. Yeah, and six, then, six, and it was the most. Yeah, next day, fifth place in the Big Twelve, I think, or maybe even sixth. I, I, that that seems like so far away. It was around Big Twelve Media Day, which was like a month over a month ago. At this point, uh, yeah, I think kind of going back to chip on the shoulder, disrespect mode a bit. Because as much as uh, there was like that week or two in the offseason where they became a buzzworthy team, it only lasted for that week or two when people really sat down and and decided to make their bold predictions. Kansas State wasn't really in the discussion. I mean, I've seen them ranked eighth or ninth in some ballots, and some some people only think they're going to win four games. So uh, I'd be surprised if they won four. I think all of us would. This is a, definitely a bold team, and but if it was just a bold team, it would probably be a little disappointing in Manhattan. I think it's been built up enough where you're looking at seven, probably perhaps being a little disappointing at this point. So yeah, they're chip on the shoulder mode at this point. I think it's got to be eight and four or better. Yeah, I would agree with that DY. And look, it wasn't even that they weren't just in the top 25. They weren't even close to the top 25. I mean, they got three or four votes that would have landed them what 37 to 44, somewhere in that range. And so, you know, you hear these, these national media guys tweeting out their opinions on Kansas state football as the dark horse to win the big 12 in July. And then you see these polls come out and, you know, it seems like Kansas state's back in kind of that underdog role that they thrive in. And so, look, I mean, I made some jokes too about the chip on the shoulder chip place back on the shoulder. And I, I think that's what's occurred now. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I think this team has a lot to prove and they're excited. I, I think they're going to prove some people wrong. Um, that didn't place Kansas State in the top 25, because I, I think undoubtedly this is a top 25 football team this year. And so uh, I, I love this team. I mean, it's the most excited I've been for a K-State football season in probably six years, dating back to maybe 2016, 17. I just think the potential 
um, for a Big 12 championship is there for this group. Agreed. I mean, to me, it's uh, going back to like I don't know, 20, 2012, uh, maybe like the 2014 season. But yeah, I didn't. I have more belief in this team, I think, than I did even in, in the 2017 team, which began the year ranked in the top 25. That was actually a preseason top 25 team. Um, okay, well, let's take it game by game. We've got South Dakota coming up first. I think I go ahead and speak for everybody and say that we think K-State is going to win the game. But I, I will caution everybody that – was it that long ago in 2018 that it took uh, some special teams magic from Isaiah Zuber to uh, beat South Dakota just barely at Bill Snyder Family Stadium, albeit Snyder's last year in a team that was really fading and and not very good, if we're being completely honest. Um, but they also have almost beaten Kansas in, in recent memory. So South Dakota is, they're no stranger to, one, playing in Manhattan. They also came in, in 2015. That was the game where Jesse Ertz got hurt uh, on the first series of the game for the Wildcats in case they won that game rather handily. But they won't be super intimidated by the atmosphere. They've been to Power 5 atmospheres, if you can even call Kansas that. But um, the point is, it's it's a losable game if you come out with a really terrible flat effort. And we've seen very good K-State teams do that. Uh, Eastern Kentucky comes to mind in 2011. But I know we're going to get in-depth on South Dakota later this week. I any other thoughts, anything else to add from you guys on week one here for the Wildcats? I expect business as usual. And with the new offensive coordinator, you'd like the defense to really take the bull by the horns in this one. Yeah, same. I mean, look, the, the 2018 game, it wasn't just that it took a Zuber punt return touchdown to spark a rally. K-State was down 24 to 12 in the fourth quarter of that game. I mean, it, it looked like a loss that was coming, but uh, Kansas State rallied. As you mentioned, John, South Dakota is a respectable FCS team. They made the FCS playoffs last year. They knocked off three top 16 teams in the FCS in the country. Um, so they're, they're not just someone that you're going to run over necessarily. You know, they're at least respectable, but I like K-State to win by 21 to 28 points. I think a lot of people are really looking forward to week two, man. You get Mizzou coming back into the crib. It's been a while since K-State has played Missouri. I can still remember the SEC chants ringing in my ears in 2011 as Mizzou left the field at Bill Snyder Family Stadium with a big fat L. Now they're coming back. I don't think this is some quintessential Missouri team with Chase Daniel by any stretch of the imagination. I also don't think that they are terrible, but this is a game where I would imagine K-State is a touchdown-ish favorite as of right now heading into to that game. Uh, it'll be juiced up. I think the atmosphere will be great. People are chomping at the bit to get just back to the the rivalry. I know there are a lot of people that hold like a, a grudge against Missouri for leaving. I'm not one of those people. I just think it's fun to get the regionality of the rivalry back. You know, a team that K-State played dating back to the, the Big 8 days, obviously, forever. And I think that's the real fun part about it. Plus, you throw in, I mean, I guess if I'm being honest, what it is mostly is much more contemporary, which is... Eli Dorkwitz, the uh, head coach of the Missouri Tigers, you know, taking Josh Manning from K-State, uh, throwing shade at a high school kid and Avery Johnson with the video that he had after he got the commitment of of Manning. So uh, there's there's some extra fuel to the fire, I think, based on what's happened recently with recruiting against Mizzou as well. And uh, and just the being in a different conference, SEC pride, even though Mizzou is basically being drug along by the top four or five teams in that conference um ever since the first couple of years with Gary Pinkle so all that being said what are your expectations for the Mizzou game week two yeah I yeah you can't begrudge Missouri they, they joined the SEC if you gave anyone that option they would be doing that in a second um so that that's where I stand on that but as far as the game goes M Missouri's going to be a quality non-conference opponent and probably one they have can't say hasn't seen it a bit. I, I think there's potential for it to be better than the Mississippi State team that they beat in Starkville, especially considering the suspensions the Mississippi State had. Um, but I do think Kansas State is the better team. Um, a touchdown favorite is probably pretty fair, especially since, you know, this Kansas State team is a lot better. I think what would have been the 2019 team that beat Mississippi State. So they've taken a real, real giant step forward. You gotta watch out for the Missouri pass rush. They got they got a pretty good defensive line, even though they weren't good against the run last year. But you hope having that um, dress rehearsal of sorts in Week One kind of helps. Missouri plays on a Thursday, so they get maybe an extra day or two of prep. Um, that probably won't matter. I think Kansas State should win this by ten. That's what I kind of envision. But I don't see them running away or thumping Missouri either because whether it's from their SEC alliance 
or or not, they have recruited very well under Eliah Drinkwitz somehow, and the talent is not a problem. Yeah, I mean, they just landed uh, one of the top five players in the country, and I think the number one receiver in the country. That'll be a freshman on this year's Missouri team coming to Manhattan. So they've landed some dudes. There's no doubt about it. And, John, to your point about Eli Drinkowitz, it's not only just the recruiting battles, but he also last year kind of stomped on the Big 12's grave and was laughing and openly mocking when Oklahoma and Texas were leaving the league and, and bragging up the SEC. And I think that rubbed people the wrong way, too. Just his personality, I think rubs opposing fan bases the wrong way. He's a good troll at, at doing some of this stuff. Yeah. And so credit to him, like, you know, it's a big year for him at Missouri. He needs to, to probably win a minimum of six games, probably needs to get to, to seven for Missouri to start to feel good about where that program is headed. But, you know, this is the biggest non-con home game for K-State since Auburn in 2014. Now that's not comparing that top five Auburn team to what Missouri is this year, but Look, you can just look at the secondary market of ticket prices and see how big this game is. It's sold out. It's been sold out for a while. Standing room only available. Fans are jacked up for this one. And partially the reason why K-State struggled for a while selling tickets this season opener because everybody's headed to game two that second weekend. Now we know the South Dakota game is probably going to be sold out. And I think K-State in the Missouri game, I, I like the Wildcats to win by 10 to 14 points, but it's going to be a heck of an atmosphere. It's going to be fun. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. I think K-State gets off to a 2-0 no start. Yeah, look, I'll give him that. I mean, Dorkwitz is a great personality. He is recruiting very well. He just he needs to win games. I mean, that's that's the part that has to follow here. He's doing a lot of other things very well. And, yes, it, it has made this, this game much more interesting. So looking forward to that. By the way, if you haven't seen the movie Wolf of Wall Street, just go look at the character Rugrat and tell me that that's not the uh, the spitting image of, uh, of Eli Dorkwitz. Uh, week three, you've got Tulane. Now, September 17th, Tulane will come into Bill Snyder Family Stadium. I uh, I was listening to Stan Weber. I mentioned I went to the, the Catbacker event out of Prairie Fire the other day, and I was listening to Stan Weber talk up Tulane and, and the fact that they have had some pretty good teams here recently, the fact that they do have Louisiana talent. Again, I think that's not a complete rollover coming into, uh, coming into Bill Snyder Family Stadium. And being that it's sandwiched in between the Missouri game, which should be very fun, a great atmosphere, and one that gets people up playing an SEC team. And then Oklahoma, to start Big 12 plays next on the schedule, there is a bit of a trap element to this game with Tulane. So, you know, that would be one that I would circle just to say, like, use some caution there, proceed with caution, and make sure that you treat them as seriously as possible. That would be my my one hang up there on Tulane, without knowing a ton, admittedly, about their roster right now. I would say... A slow start would not surprise me in that one. And then uh, a strong finish to just kind of wipe them off the map, so to speak. I mean, as much as you want to say as Louisiana talent, and I know that they competed with Oklahoma last year and kind of had the Sooners on the ropes a little bit at times. Uh, they still went 2-10. and 10, So I'm, I'm just not exactly sure what to expect. But I think a slow start and Kansas State pulls away. I, I feel like this is a dangerous game. Uh, not necessarily Kansas State's going to lose, but I think it could be competitive. And the reason being the sandwich game scenario that John mentioned, but also last year was an outlier for Tulane and Willie Fritz. Like Willie Fritz is a good football coach. They went to three consecutive bowls before last season. Then last year they go two and 10. Uh, obviously they went to OU and they lost 40 to 35, but they had the football with a chance to win that game in the last two minutes. And then their season really went downward. I don't know a ton about their roster. We'll dive into it more on game week when that gets here. But I would just say, look, they're a respectable opponent traditionally in the last few years. Outlier was last year. Uh, but I still think Kansas State will win that game, probably between 14 to 17 points. I would think the same. I'm in the same kind of boat. And wasn't it, was it two years ago that they gave Oklahoma a real push when Spencer was Rattler was there? Last year. It was last year. That was last year? Okay. They recovered the – it was right after K-State beat Stanford in the opener, and that game was was wrapping up as well. They recovered right. the yeah. onside kick and were driving with a chance to win. I only know this because I was driving back to the lake, John, while uh, my friends in the back were, were playing it on their phone. Okay. So. Okay. There we go. All right. Well, you open up Big 12 play at Oklahoma. Look, we think this team has – K-State, Big 12 championship potential in 2012. The last time K-State won a Big 12 championship, they started Big 12 play on the road at Oklahoma and pulled off the upset, won that game, and it, it springboarded the rest of the season. Now, I don't know that I'm going to predict K-State going out and winning this game. I don't know. I'm going to listen to what you guys have to say and then sit on the fence and kind of decide where I'm going with this. But 
I will say this about the Oklahoma game. I love it being this early in the season, being that Oklahoma is the program that is going through so much transition right now with Brent Venables taking over as the head coach, with a new offensive coordinator, with a new quarterback, uh, theoretically a new style of play, probably one that leans more on defense than they, they did in the past. There's just a lot of adjusting that will need to happen there for Oklahoma. So they may get some things figured out by the end of the year. I am of the opinion that they will take a slight step back under Venables this year. So I am I am very happy with the location of this game on the schedule. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of that reasons why I can't stay winning. And some of it's also just, you know, if you erase 2018, Kansas State's been right there with Oklahoma in every game. I mean, they barely lost in 17, even with Bill Snyder at the helm. They beat them in 19. They uh, beat them in 20. Barely lost last year in 21. They were right there again when they, with the late late charge at the end. Uh, Kansas State, for whatever reason, is kind of has Oklahoma's number or kind of has them figured out. This is a new staff, but if, that might even help because I think Oklahoma does take a step back. But what does it – think about what a step back could possibly look like for Oklahoma. They didn't make the Big 12 championship game last year. So are we talking about – a dominant football team, I'm not so sure. And like you said, early on in the season is probably where they're going to go through their most growing pains, right? So first Big 12 game, Brent Venables is still figuring himself out as a head coach, and that roster is still being figured out because it's just a myriad of misfits at this point. First time since the 2014 season, Oklahoma hasn't been the preseason pick to win the Big 12, and I would agree with that. I think this Oklahoma team probably finishes fourth or fifth in the league, more middle of the pack. I think there's going to be a lot of growing pains with Brent Venables as the coach. Jeff Levy is a good offensive coordinator, but I think he's going to, it's going to take a little bit of time to install his system. So I think there's going to be some bumps in the road. I want to say Oklahoma has 50 new guys on their roster as well as what Brent Venables said, a number right around there. Um, so they're going to have some kinks that they got to work out. I love like what you said, John, where this game falls on the schedule is the big 12 opener. I also like that it falls right after Oklahoma plays at Nebraska. I mean, look, we can make fun of Nebraska for what happened in Ireland last weekend, but I still think that's going to be a big game. Um, and really maybe a, a career saving game for Scott Frost, if he could win it, we'll see. Um, but that's going to be a difficult challenge for Oklahoma. Um, and then coming home for the big 12 opener against K-State. I like K-State to win this game. Um, so I, I think the Wildcats go down to Norman. Adrian Martinez has also played in Norman. He's been through it. They yeah. played there last year, and, and they were right there yeah. in a game. I think a lot of people thought it would be a blowout. What was it, a five- to seven-point outcome? I so, think it was 23-16. Yeah. yeah. So I like K-State to win and uh, get off to a, a 4-0 start, and by then they'll probably be ranked top 15, top 20 in the country. Let me just point out that Cole just predicted Oklahoma to finish fourth or fifth in the Big 12. Fourth or fifth. So just my my advice to you, Cole, would be don't tweet that because inevitably Eddie Radosevich will take it, quote tweet it, and then your mentions will be filled with Oklahoma fans for the next four days. Technically, uh, so did you, right? Because they went third in the Big 12 last year and said they're taking a step back. I think they'll be like nine and three. That's that's what I think. Well, I think Oklahoma's like a nine and three team. John, my go-to move is to troll Nebraska and Iowa State fans on Twitter. So I won't go after OU. Uh, okay. I, I, know, I know. I don't want to bark up that tree. They've become a sensitive fan base though. That's for sure. Oh my God. Scorned lover and a half. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I'll slam dunk at home. I'll, I'll pick K-State to win here too. And and on Adrian Martinez to tie this all back in, we, we haven't talked or really reacted to the Nebraska game. And I, I know it's a K-State podcast, but I think that Nebraska game should give you more confidence in this kind of narrative and storyline around Adrian Martinez that he is going to thrive this year because Nebraska, that was a carbon copy of games that they played with Adrian Martinez, what happened against Northwestern, which would indicate to me much more about the system, much more about Frost, much more about all the pressures there at Nebraska than it is Adrian himself. So that gives me much more confidence that he is going to be a stud. Cole's right. Nebraska played pretty well last year in Norman, albeit mostly the defense, but uh, he he hung toe to toe with Oklahoma right there. He's not going to be intimidated at all. Certainly, Deuce Vaughn isn't. He's won in that stadium before. Uh, a lot of guys on the K State roster have after two years ago. So I'll take K State. Let's go four and zero, baby. Um, next up on the schedule, K State will return home to take on Texas Tech. Uh, Red Raiders new this year under Joey McGuire. Um, you know, I think Tyler Shuck is 
is decent as a quarterback, but the rest of the roster, I, they have a great recruiting class put together for 2023, but they're not obviously going to be on campus yet. I actually am pretty bullish on Joey McGuire uh, if he can coach a lick. You know, I mean, it's kind of like a Jerome Tang sort of situation where he's come in, won everybody over with the press conferences, killed it on the recruiting trail, um, and been a man of the people. But what is it going to look like when he actually gets out there on the field and has to coach? I would not expect them to win this game that early in Joey McGuire's career in Manhattan, though. Yeah, what, what's interesting is they, they made a bowl game last year. I think they won the bowl game. They did. They beat good old Mike Leach. Yeah, and they return like some of them. They have the most returning stuff, you know, in the Big 12. But obviously you have the transition there with Coach McGuire. Don't, don't know how much he can coach, but he can do about everything else right, as you alluded to. He's a galvanizing force, which kind of makes me think that they're probably going to be a little more dangerous at home this year, maybe not so much on the road, especially maybe at this point in the schedule. So coming off the big win in Norman, I, I mean, this is another game where Kansas State maybe starts slow, but I think they they handle Texas Tech, so to speak, at home. You know, I'm looking at another 10, two touchdown win. Yeah. Zach Kitley comes in as the offensive coordinator from Western Kentucky, ran one of the better offenses last year. He'll be the Tech OC. So I think they're going to be solid offensively defensively I think will once again be a struggle for Texas Tech um I actually kind of like their backup quarterback more than their starter that they named Shuck I like Donovan Williams more but uh I was surprised I'm not necessarily surprised that Shuck won the job he's more experienced I like Texas or I like K-State excuse me to to win by 10 to 14 like DY and get off to a 5-0 and start boy Starting to sound like uh, Kansas State might be in the national title. <laughs> no, I know. Well, listen, all right, yeah, Homer podcast here. I'm about to bring that all crashing down. Okay, you guys ready for this? Because yeah. what's, what's next up on the schedule? It's a little trip to Ames on October 8th. Uh, you got to go play the Iowa State Cyclones. Now, here's kind of my stance on Iowa State this year. They they had very similar to what K State's roster is this year, where littered with all Big 12 players. Iowa State littered the all Big 12 list last year. They still only went seven and six. Um, and if you start to take a step back and look at it, it really does look like that pandemic year was kind of the outlier in what Matt Campbell has been generally seven and five. But I think Iowa State, I, the thing with Campbell is I think, well, his ceiling is much lower than what the outside world appears to think. I also think his floor is pretty high. Like I don't expect them to, to just totally tank. I think they're still a bull team this year. Um, I just think they'll always be kind of in that six and six to seven and five, maybe eight and four sort of window. And uh, because of that, I think that's a it's a pretty tricky game. Iowa State's really had K-State's number over the last couple of years. Uh, even if this team is really riding high and as much as I hate to say it, that seems like a really tough spot on the schedule to go play that game in Ames. Iowa State will maybe have some things figured out by then if they, they can get quarterback. Uh, really going in particular, having to replace Brock Purdy, who I think was very overrated anyway. Um, I'm, I'm going to have K-State taking a very close L in Ames as much as it pains me to say it. A lot of that makes sense, but I, I guess I don't mind where it's at on the schedule because it is coming after the Texas Tech game. It's not coming after Oklahoma or Baylor or Oklahoma State or anything like that. So I, I don't think there's a lot of mental, psycho psychological stuff that's really going to come into play here. It's just going to be kind of a mono a mono game in, in Ames, Iowa. And look, I think Chris Kleiman's a really good coach. I think Matt Campbell's a pretty good coach, but I think Kansas State has a better roster this year. And they're just kind of primed for, you know, whatever they might be capable of doing. I think it's like an overtime type win in Ames. I really do. Um, and I've said it before on multiple different podcasts and on, on our site, this is the swing game of the season because, you know, looking ahead, TCU's next. So you, you kind of think that should be a winnable game as well. If you're able to beat Iowa State and you've already defeated Oklahoma, like some all of us have predicted, you're talking about, you know, a 7-0 and no start before you get into the meat of the schedule. Yeah, I, I hope I'm wrong on this. I hope John's wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Iowa State to win a very close game. John and I will probably be in Ames in the seats sitting together. So hopefully we don't have to deal with that actually. And John DY will be safe in the press box with plumbing and water falling. I was just going to say, got to watch out uh, for some water though. Yeah, so, I'll, 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 yeah, yeah we'll well, my last trip, last two trips to Ames, one was a plumbing situation in the press box where everyone's getting their computers leaked on by dirty water. And in the next one, or it might have been the same game. It might have, actually, I think it was. It the was the same game, game with the storm. Yeah. I, cause I, well, yeah, the storm, but I missed because of the 2021 because of COVID. So this is all 2018, I believe. 
And this is when we kind of knew this, that was probably Bill Snyder's last game. And our, our hotel room, KSO, we're in this hotel. And literally the, the hotel room next to us is Gene Taylor. We're, and we're like, think about putting cups up against the wall and listening to the conversation. <laughs> so now that, that was an interesting time because I think everyone kind of knew, especially the, the fashion that they lost to names that year, that that was probably Bill Snyder's last ride. Well, you'll be in the 100-foot square press box at uh, Jack Dry <laughs> Stadium, DY. John and I will be in the seats, and uh, I think Iowa State's going to win a close game. And look, if K State, and, and part of that is why, if K State is off to a five and zero start, we know Iowa State is notorious for knocking off top fifteen, top ten teams at home. Big games, they thrive in that game and atmosphere when a Big Ten opponent comes in highly ranked. Um, and so I, I just think they've kind of got K State's number. And again, I, I hope I'm wrong. Um, but I, I do view this as kind of a swing game because if K-State does lose to Oklahoma, this kind of becomes a must win. And yeah. I, I think ultimately K-State, if they can get through the first six games, five and one heading into the bye week, which is next, then I think they're in a pretty good spot. I would agree. Totally agree. With the bye week, we'll take a second here to uh, recognize DraftKings, one of our sponsors here now on the pod. Uh, so Kansas, look, Everybody needs to be aware of the fact you're about to be able to uh, to bet coming up later on this week. But DraftKings Sportsbook is coming to the Sunflower States. Won't be long until you can bet on all your favorite sports from the comfort of your own home. To celebrate, all new customers will receive $100 in free bets when you sign up using code KCSN. That's code KCSN. Plus, one lucky customer will win a $100,000 bet for free. That's right. DraftKings Sportsbook is giving you $100 in free bets just for signing up today. No deposit required, and soon you'll be able to bet on money lines, spreads, props, and more with one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, DraftKings Sportsbook. Plus, you're entered to win a $100,000 free bet when you sign up. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and sign up with code KCSN to get $100 in free bets to use once mobile sports betting hits Kansas. Plus, one customer will win a $100,000 free bet. That's code KCSN only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Getting help is your best bet. Call 800-522-4700. 21 and older, physically present in Kansas. Eligibility restrictions apply. See terms at DraftKings.com slash sportsbook. Subject to regulatory licensing requirements. One per customer, $100 issued as four $25 free bets. No purchase necessary for sweepstakes. Void where prohibited. Ends first day, DraftKings is allowed to operate in Kansas. See terms at DraftKings.com slash Kansas. All right, off the bye week, K-State travels to Fort Worth and TCU. For some reason, there are a few folks out there who have taken to TCU as being some kind of dark horse for the Big 12 title. I don't – I mean, look, Chandler Morris had an impressive game against Baylor last year. I don't know what's happening with TCU's quarterback situation because Sonny Dyke said they may use up to three in their season opener against Colorado this week. Max Duggan, I've just seen enough of him over time. I don't really think he has a hugely high ceiling. And Sonny Dykes was a fairly uninspired hire to me. So I'm just very blah on TCU. Now, they Gary Patterson put together a dismal coaching performance in Manhattan last year. So they're at least, I think, modernizing themselves a bit. But I I do not stress much about that game. Not much of an atmosphere at Amon G. Carter Stadium. I I think K-State will win that game. I agree. Not much of an atmosphere and that – on the surface, I didn't really like the Sunny Dykes hire, and and I don't consider them a dark horse Big 12 top contender either. Interestingly enough, I have TCU winning this, though. Um, I I just think that at that Cole's point, face. Season, what I just love Cole's reaction, he gave you a little bit of a face. There. I know. Look, their defense can't be worse than it was last year. If you look at the metrics, it's 115th or worse in nearly every metric, so it can't get worse, and their offense will get better. So they are a more improved team. They have only one of the three offensive coordinators in the entire country that has had a top five offense for five years in a row, and Garrett Riley as well. And I think at this point in the schedule, they'll have their quarterback stuff figured out. I think Chandler Morris will be the quarterback, and I think he kind of fits what they want to do. And I think it's a trap game where it sits on a schedule. Yes, it comes after the bye week, but it comes after the Iowa State game and before the meat and potatoes of the schedule that that consists of Oklahoma State Baylor and Texas. So I just don't like the fit of where it sits at the schedule. I think TCU is going to be an improved team, not a big 12 tile contender, but an improved team. I think this is a scary game for, for the cats. See, we, we differ because I think it falls in a good spot on the schedule coming off the bye. I think K-State can reset after the Oklahoma, Texas tech, Iowa state games reset here, kind of middle of the season. 
and uh, go down to TCU and and pull that game out. Chris Kleiman's three and zero against TCU, albeit those were against Gary Patterson coach teams. There is some talent on TCU. There's no question. I mean, look, they've got one of the best receivers, if not the best receiver in the Big Twelve, and Quentin Johnston. Um, and Kendra Miller is a very talented running back. I mean, everyone talked about Zach Evans last year, but Kendra Miller was averaging seven and a half yards per carry all season and rushed for nearly 700 yards. He's back. They got some talent at receiver. Tay Barber, Darius Davis, their top three receivers are back. They've listed four starting running backs on their depth chart, which is interesting. But to your point, D.Y., their defense was 125th in the country in points per drive allowed last year uh, out of 130 FBS teams. I just can't see Sonny Dykes fixing that. A Sonny Dykes coach team doesn't strike me as a team that's going to play great defense. Now, I know they were better than what his teams usually are the last couple of years at SMU, but I don't think they'll get the defensive issues straightened out enough. So I like Kansas State to, to win that game. All right. So I think everybody here at this point, we've got K State at six and one, right? Just a different loss. We've got the Cats at six and one rolling into homecoming against uh, Oklahoma State in Manhattan. Boy, I've got some bad memories from that game two years ago when uh, K State really should have won. The Will Howard fumble that was run back uh, will will live in infamy for a long time. Ah, I'm pretty torn on this one. I mean, Oklahoma State. I think it, it's kind of the same deal as Matt Campbell, but up a, a notch or two. Obviously, we saw the ceiling that they have last year, almost making the playoff and winning the Fiesta Bowl. Um, But it's like I just expect Mike Gundy, no matter what, he's going to put together about an eight or a nine win team. So I I think they'll be pretty salty, even though Spencer Sanders, I I, I still worry about the the turnover problems that he has. They replaced Jim Knowles, one of the best defensive coordinators in the country with Derek Mason, who I also think is very good. I would expect a slight drop off this year from Oklahoma State. I'm a little higher on Baylor uh, out of the two Big 12 championship game participants from last year. K-State being back at home here. This is where I've been saying all year, like I'm kind of predicting K State at nine and three. This is one where I feel like that that's going to determine will K State be ten and two and have a legitimate chance to make it to Arlington in the Big Twelve Championship game, or be nine and three and just miss out. That, to me, this is like the game uh, that they would need to win in order to do that. And I'm on the Homer podcast here. I'm not on the YouTube channel, so you know what? What the hell? I'll take K State to win. I I have Kansas State winning. I do think Oklahoma State is going to take a step back. How how big that step back is probably minimal, as you said. Mike Gundy's a hell of a coach, so that that plays into it. But I think Jim Knowles is a pretty significant loss on the defense. They might have the best defensive line in the Big Twelve. Well, of Baylor. course, why he went to Ohio State. Of course, you think that them Baylor, K State, those are the probably the three elite lines in the league. Um, but the rest of that defense worries me a little bit because there's a lot of turnover on the rest in the, in the back seven, back eight. Um, Jim Knowles is a big figure. Look, Spencer Sanders is a solid quarterback. He, he was all Big 12 first team last year, almost by default, but he was all Big 12 first team last year. But if you ask him to win a handful of games, I think that's when he falters. And that's what they're going to have to do this year. They're going to have to ask him to go win some games because the defense isn't going to always be able to bail them out like they did a season ago. Kansas State's felt like they were been on the cusp of finally getting over the hump against Oklahoma State the last year or two. It's one of the teams that Chris Kleiman hasn't defeated yet in the Big 12. I think he gets it done at home this year. Yeah, I think Kansas State wins this game as well and knocks off Oklahoma State for the first time in the Kleiman era. John, you mentioned the the 2020 game. The 2016 game haunts me when uh, Kansas State led Mm. by 9, 10 points. Bill Snyder didn't go for it on the fourth down and one at the mid U field and then slipped away. Uh, There's been some heartbreaking losses to OSU, no doubt. Uh, But I think because of the aforementioned things that you guys just mentioned, Jim Knowles being gone, they lost a lot at the linebacker position and in the secondary, a lot of talented pieces. Malcolm Rodriguez is gone and several other guys. I I think Kansas State wins this game. It'll be a close game, but I think Spencer Sanders will be the difference maker in K-State's favor because he's just notorious for turning the ball over, and I think K-State's defense will force some turnovers there. Love it. All right, 7-1 and going into Texas on November 5th. Longhorns – let me just set the stage for you with what Texas's offseason has been like. Stuart Mandel predicted them to go four and eight. Okay. That's a national guy at the athletic. They also received a national first place vote in the coaches poll. Like, so someone has predicted them to win the national championship and someone else has predicted them to go four and eight. And look, say what you will about Stuart Mandel, but the guy has had a, a career in this and is a legitimate college football journalist. So, like, that's the range on Texas. You tell me where they fall. I, It sounds like things have been kind of a mess 
with their offseason. They already have the Bama receiver transfer suspended indefinitely. They lost the Wyoming receiver transfer for the year for an injury. They lost a starting offensive lineman for the year for an injury. There were rumors out of camp that Hudson Card was out playing Quinn Ewers, the super stud quarterback coming in this year. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian, in order to thwart those rumors, just busted, had his SID bust into a different press conference to blurt out to the media that Quinn Ewers was going to be the starter. I think they still have big culture problems. I still think they're going to be like five and seven to seven and five. And I don't think there's any chance that they win him in that. I think their ceiling was probably before the the stuff was was not a national title contender, but it was maybe a trip to Arlington just because of the talent that they consist of. And Steve Sarkeesian, not sure how much of a head coach he is, but he's a great offensive play caller. So I don't necessarily worry about that side of the ball, even if they didn't take maybe the quarterback that earned um, earned the job because Quinn Ewers is probably going to be good enough. I, it's a tough game to pick. I will I will say that. But it, we're further along in the schedule where you are – they're inviting more disaster just because of who they are, Texas. I don't think that they've alleviated those culture issues at all either. I do think Kansas State's going to have to play a pretty good game. I do think that they'll probably have to score a lot of points to win, but I think they can. I'll take, I'll take K-State. Yeah, I think things are still a bit of a mess down there. It doesn't sound great from some secondhand information I've gotten. So uh, I, I think I, I picked Texas to be a team that could be in the Big 12 championship probably a month ago. I'm going back on that prediction. I, I think Texas is probably going to be a seven and five football team this year, uh, even though they have a ton of talent. Bijan Robinson, Xavier Worthy, Quinn Ewers. I still think they're going to struggle. I like Kansas State to win this game. Eight and one going into Baylor, and uh, this this is a really tough putt, man. I I like Baylor a lot. I understand that they they lost a bunch, particularly like in the back end of that defense. They have a new quarterback basically this year in Blake Shapin, but K State knows exactly how good he can be because he played a really really good game in Manhattan last year and in, in filling in for Gary Bohannon, who's now transferred to USF. But going to Baylor, they have a lot of studs back on both lines. I think Dave Aranda is the best coach in the Big 12, and I do like the upside of Shapin. Uh, they've got a lot of what I would consider to be like championship DNA still in that program. I, I think that's a tough one. I would expect Baylor to win that game. I did too. I'm, I'm taking Baylor as well. It's the championship DNA. It's being in Waco. And even if they were to take a step back and maybe not be – a runaway title favorite, which everyone's kind of anointing them as, despite losing all that talent. This is game 10. <laughs> like if the, if the, all that turnover was probably what hampered them by game 10, they're going to be clicking. And the, then Kansas state's going to get the best version of Baylor. And to me, that's kind of problematic on the road. So I'll take Baylor. Look, they did lose a lot. Abram Smith, the big, tw- he had the best running season in, in Baylor history. Um, the best season running the football. Uh, he's gone. Tristan Ebner, their second string running back, got drafted, I believe, in the sixth round. Um, and then, obviously, Tyquan Thornton, their leading receiver, drafted in the second round by the Patriots. They had four defensive guys drafted, including Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, you know, Jalen Petrie. That's a huge loss. Um, one of their linebackers got drafted, their corner, et cetera. They've lost a lot of pieces, but they're good up front. And, John, to what you said, I just I trust Dave Aranda really like him, have a ton of respect for him. They'll be ready to go in that game. That's just going to be such a difficult atmosphere as well, especially if K-State's rolling in eight and one. They're going to have a target on their back. K-State's going to be top 10 in the country. So I I think this is a game the Wildcats slip up and they drop to eight and two. Kleiman's had a lot of trouble with Baylor too. That's another thing to uh, to throw in here. So, all right, eight and two and final two games of the year. Now, this is a tricky one, man. November 19th, you have to go to West Virginia. And that's that's not because I think West Virginia is going to be any kind of world beater this year. West Virginia fans certainly uh, seem to think that they're going to be pretty good. And and I understand some optimism with getting JT Daniels in there at quarterback, uh, former USC Trojan, former Georgia Bulldog, et cetera, et cetera. But, man, they just – Neil Brown has left a lot to be desired, and I'm somebody that believed a lot in him when he took over at West Virginia. It feels like there's too many holes. They've never really been able to figure out that offense. There was a reason JT Daniels wasn't playing at, at Georgia last year and Stetson Bennett, you know, who everybody kind of views as this milk toast quarterback wins the national championship for him. Uh, I, I think K-State will win a very tight game. It It's all about the fact that it's such a long, awkward road trip. It's at the end of the year. We're talking about coming off a disappointing, pretty bitter loss. Um, I think it'll be tricky, but I'll, I'll pick K-State to win a close game. It's a long, awkward road trip, but Kansas State's probably pretty pissed, right, if, if the season unfolds where we just 
kind of mapped out because they just lost to Baylor and, you know, any, any shot at, you know, a potential playoff appearance, you kind of feel, you know, whatever that, that I might've slipped out of your fingers. And then on the flip side, this could be also the part of the schedule where West Virginia is completely checked out um, in my opinion, because if they are as pedestrian as I think, then we're talking about Neil Brown hot seat potential, but maybe, maybe the, crazy buyout that he has after the season keeps him there. But still those, the, those rumblings, that chatter, that's going to be there if I am correct. And think about where it's on the schedule. I think where things are on the schedule is so important. That's why I keep bringing it up. It's game 11. Is there anyone confident here that JT Daniels is healthy by game 11? I sure not. So I, I don't really know what they're going to have at the quarterback position, the most important spot on the field. I, to be, to be honest, I think this has a recipe for Kansas State just blowing the doors off of West Virginia, even if it's in Morgantown. Yeah, I think the difficulty, gauging the difficulty of this game is very dependent on where it falls on the schedule, like what D.Y. said. So there's a good chance West Virginia is sitting at, what, five and five, four and six at this point. And if they're at that point, the, the chatter about Neil Brown getting fired, it's rampant. Uh, is that team really bought in and invested? Are they ready to play? I don't think so. I, I think that there's a there's a chance that K-State wins this game in controllable fashion by 14, 21 points. Um, and to your point about JT Daniels, that popped in my head too. Like his health has always been a concern. And you're talking about next to last game of the year. Now, we'd be remiss if we didn't point out Adrian Martinez has also been banged up a lot in his career. And a lot of our predictions are on him staying healthy based on that. But yeah, I, I think K-State wins and gets back on the you know nine and two. There's a lot to play for still. No playoff, but if they're sitting in this scenario and the losses are what we lined out, K-State is still going to play in the Big 12 championship in all likelihood if they can get to 10-2. and two. Because the last week of the regular season is Kansas. They're coming into uh, Bill Snyder Family Stadium right after Thanksgiving. Look, I don't think K-State will have any problem here, and I'm, I'm, I'm not like a Lance Leipold hater. I, I just think there's been an overcorrection toward Kansas actually having a coach that can walk and chew gum at the same time for the first time in forever. And so there's been a bit of an overreaction to the step that Kansas can take this year. I, I still would envision them as a three, maybe four win sort of team. And they're going to be pretty far behind what K-State mm-hmm. is. Uh, so look, Leipold is clearly getting that program's act together to an extent, but not to the extent enough to come into Manhattan and win this year. Uh, so I'll take K-State by three, four touchdowns. Look, Kansas is not special. There probably has been an overcorrection. Um, the difference being now that they are competent, they are functional, they have a purpose and a plan on each side of the ball each week. Uh, for the most part, they're fundamentally sound, and they just comprehend the, the principles and concepts of the game of football. Um, that wasn't always under to the case under the last several coaches, and that's why they look the joke that they, they were. Um, Kansas is not good enough or they're not talented enough to line up nearly every Saturday and feel good about winning that game or having a chance to even win that game. Um, the, that, that's just not in their, in their power, but they are good enough to make the other team go win it. So Kansas state will have to go win it. And I think they will. And I, I still see it as a, you know, you know, like a 34, 10 kind of win. Yeah, look, Jalen Daniels, by that point in the season, assuming he's still starting quarterback, will have had a lot of experience under his belt. Uh, when he came to Manhattan in 2020, he was extremely young, uh, I think 17 or 18 years old, playing in that game. And, you know, he finished the year strong. KU landed some decent transfers on the defensive side of the football. And then, obviously, Kai Thomas, the the talented running back out of Minnesota. There's no doubt KU's got a very talented backfield with Devin Neal and Thomas, but their defensive side of the football is still a huge mess, even though they did land some impact transfers on the side of the ball. KU was 130th out of 130 FBS teams and points per drive allowed last year, dead last in the country. I don't think they're going to be able to get it straightened out enough. I still think this is probably a three and nine football team and uh, K-State rolls. All right. So we've got K-State presumably, I guess, here in the Big 12 championship game in all likelihood, a 10 and two regular season with uh, each of us just getting there a little bit differently. And again, I, I always I waver between nine and three, 10 and two. I think the games to pay attention to there would be Oklahoma, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, and then even to me, West Virginia at, at the end of the year there, which I, I feel like is in a tricky spot depending on where they're at. So uh, any any final thoughts here on, on K-State's season and where things uh, are at? I would have them in the Big 12 title game. I, it might be a rematch with Baylor. 
depending on how things go. The re- and, I don't even, and I even feel great about Baylor being there, to be honest. Like, I, it's almost like a default thing for me because I don't think Texas is ready, and I think Oklahoma and Oklahoma State take enough steps back, enough steps back where I can't justify anyone else besides Baylor. It's the most wide open the Big 12 has been in a long time, and I also struggle to find the other team that's going to be in the title game, and I'm just going to go with Baylor by default. I think it's Kansas State versus Baylor playing for a Big 12 championship. I'm a little concerned that we all have the same thing here. Like, we got the same record. We're not different on a lot of things. We got the same Big 12 title participants. A little echo chamber, yeah. Uh, so that, that has me hit pause a little bit. I mean, look, I'm predicting K-State to the Big 12 championship, but – I do think to what John said, nine and three, I think they do get at least nine wins. I feel confident in that. Really, I think the OU game, picking that as a win is probably my biggest question mark on the games that we just went through. I think my confidence would be eight wins and the rest is like, it could fluctuate after that. I I think I'm somewhere in between there. Like in terms of being satisfied and happy with the season, the program taking a step nine wins is nine, what I want to yeah. see. I would but, agree uh, nine, nine has to be that. Yeah. But like Kleiman's been a safe bet outside of the crazy COVID year. I mean, Kleiman's been a safe bet to hit eight. So uh, I'm with you. I think that is kind of the baseline. So there's a little like 50,000 foot view of the season. Uh, our next pod, which will be released tomorrow, is going to be more focusing in, hyper-focused on game week for South Dakota, getting you ready for K-State South Dakota, the depth chart, what we heard at the press conference, D.Y. had a chance to talk to Deuce Vaughn. Uh, so there's a lot of good stuff coming up on that pod. Be sure and tune in for that. Get your 360 vodka. Get your Ben Holiday bottle and Bond bourbon from Holiday Distillery. Get those Charlie Hustle shirts and make sure you're ready to uh, to bet with DraftKings when that hits uh, later this week in the state of Kansas. So for Tucker Franklin, behind the scenes, all the work that he does there for Cole Manbeck and Derek Young, I am John Kurtz. Appreciate you guys listening to another 3 Ma. Share it. Tell all your friends about it. Leave us reviews. People, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it is, leave us reviews, five-star us. All that stuff really helps. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon.